soft chambers versus hard chambers. Better said, lower pressure, like 1.3 atmospheres versus higher pressure, 2.0 atmospheres. This is a gaping hole in the literature that I get asked every time I teach a class, present from stage, or even make a video on YouTube. And quite honestly, through my own frustrations of saying, I don't know, we don't know, the answers aren't there yet, I chose to go back to school, do a PhD in molecular biology with a focus in regenerative medicine, and do an entire research project on answering that very question. And that's what we're gonna cover in today's video. So in this research project, we asked a lot of questions. We had a lot of testing. And so to report all of these findings in a single video, it would just be too long. So we're gonna break this up into sections. In this video, we're gonna talk about the overview of research, the challenges in research design, the research design that I chose, the people who went through, what the methods were, and an overview of the results comparing lower pressure and higher pressure hyperbarics over a series of treatments. But in the follow-up videos to this series, I will discuss the different variables that we looked at more in detail. So we looked at a series of cytokines, we looked at cognitive assessments, we looked at epigenetics and DNA methylation panels. So we will go into more detail in the videos that follow. So for decades, we have known that higher pressure hyperbarics can reduce inflammation. We know that it mobilizes stem cells. We know that it stimulates a variety of different growth factors for healing, repairing, and regeneration of tissue. There have been studies on cognitive performance and the ability of hyperbaric to help with cognitive decline in a variety of different neurological degenerative diseases. But what we don't have consensus on yet is what are the best protocols for all of these different cases that we're using hyperbaric for? And do other pressures have a similar or the same or a completely different effect than higher pressure hyperbarics? So what I really wanted to create here was the first comparative study using 1.3 with enriched oxygen versus 2.0 with enriched oxygen and measuring the same parameters to understand what the differences were in the patients who received lower pressures and in the patients that received higher pressures. Quite honestly, I view this more as a pilot study. We casted a really large net looking at a ton of different factors, mostly just to understand what effects were low pressure having and what effects were high pressure having and where should future research go. But I do think we collected enough really interesting information and really important details to understand the implications of using mild pressure hyperbarics and using higher pressure hyperbarics. So let's talk about study design. In hyperbarics, it's a very difficult conversation because obviously the control group is not getting a treatment at all. And in good research, we often will have a sham group. The sham group is supposed to receive a fake treatment. So they thought they got treated, but they never actually received a therapeutic dose. One of the biggest challenges in hyperbaric medicine is the sham because you know if you're in a chamber or you're not. And the divers inside the chambers also know if their ears are getting pressurized, they're experiencing hyperbaric. So to fake that is a very difficult process. In fact, throughout the literature, there is a use of a sham treatment, which has been done at 1.3 on air. Now, the problem with that is that many of these studies show improvement in the sham group, which then decreases the benefits noted in some of the other treatment groups because the sham is supposed to be a fake treatment. We did a whole video on the issues in hyperbaric research and the use of the sham. So if you want more information about that, please check out that video. In this particular study, I chose not to have a sham. It's not impossible to do it, and those details are in that other video I referenced, but it's difficult to have a really good sham, so I chose not to have one. So we had three groups. We had a mild pressure treatment group, so they received 1.3 atmospheres on 100% oxygen. We had a high pressure treatment group. They received two atmospheres on 100% oxygen. And then we had a control group. Each of the treatment groups received 100 minutes of hyperbaric oxygen three times a week for five weeks. During that 100 minutes, they each received four air breaks, 20 minutes on oxygen, five minutes air, 20 minutes oxygen, five minutes air. So we did four air breaks with each treatment. They did a series of five weeks. Then they had a month off. They did another series of five weeks, and then they were finished. We took baseline measurements, we then tested everybody after the first five weeks of treatment. We then tested after the next five weeks of treatment. And then we waited another four weeks post-treatment and measured one more time. The control group during that time got a baseline test and a 14-week post-test to make sure that they had no improvements during the course of time that the treatment groups were going through their therapy. 
At the end of that entire block of therapy, the control group was then split in half. Half were randomized into the mild pressure group and the other were randomized into the high pressure group. We used a crossover because the crossover model starts to allow you to replicate your own research right out of the gate, assuming that the control group had no benefits during the first 14 weeks, and then they shared similar benefits to the group that they were randomized in. It starts to replicate the results right away. We had 10 people in each group, so 10 in the mild group, 10 in the high pressure group, and 10 in the control group. And then of the 10 in the control, five went into each of the treatment groups for that second round of therapy. So our initial N was 30. These were 40 to 70-year-old individuals, mixed male and female. They had to never have had hyperbaric before, and they had to be non-diagnosed and asymptomatic. In other words, this wasn't a research project to look at hyperbaric's effect on a disease process. It was a project to look at the effect of hyperbaric oxygen on an otherwise healthy American. I'm using the term asymptomatic and non-diagnosed because I believe that most humans are not expressing their highest level of health. And so I wanted to look at does hyperbaric reduce inflammation in an otherwise healthy population? Does hyperbaric improve cognitive function in an otherwise healthy population? Does hyperbaric shift the epigenome in an otherwise healthy population? And so I really wanted to use that because I'm trying to get away from utilizing hyperbaric for disease processes or the treatment of a disease. And rather, I really want to look at this as a tool for improving physiology, regardless of what your health status happens to be. As far as measurements go, we did an 81 marker cytokine panel. So looking at a variety of different inflammatory and growth factors inside this panel. We did a computerized cognitive assessment using Neurotrax, which has been utilized in other hyperbaric research. So we utilized Neurotrax because we wanted consistency inside the hyperbaric literature. And then we did a 900 marker genome-wide epigenetic methylation panel so that we could assess the entire effect of hyperbaric on the epigenome. Inside the algorithms for those epigenetic tests, we could look at what's called differentially methylated loci, so changes in methylation patterns in the epigenome. We could look at epigenetic biomarker proxies, which is using the epigenome as a reflection of other physiological biomarkers inside the blood with a very, very high level of correlation. We could also use those algorithms to assess telomere length and overall cellular aging. So all of that data is inside the epigenetic testing that we did. Now, when I started this research journey, what I expected to find was that lower pressures had certain effects, higher pressures had certain effects, that the magnitude of effect in the higher pressure would be greater than the magnitude at lower pressure, ultimately that there would be similar outcomes, but that it would take longer for the lower pressure group to catch up to the higher pressure group. Another point to bring up when I first started this project, I had a few people well-known in the industry come up to me and say, it's very likely that you're going to find out that lower pressure really does not have the effect that other people or that you think that it has. And my answer to that was great, because right now we have a lot of people in the industry that are claiming that lower pressure has all kinds of effects. Maybe even that lower pressure has the exact same effects as higher pressure. And if it turns out that lower pressure or mild hyperbarics just doesn't move the needle, then there are a lot of people out there that are misleading their patients, their customers, their clients, and they need this information so that we can get the truth of what hyperbaric is or is not. Likewise, if it turns out that mild hyperbarics does have a very important and meaningful impact, then there are a lot of people on the other side of that conversation that have been saying lower pressure doesn't do anything at all and that there's no research to support it that need this information so that they could stop misleading or misdirecting their patients, their customers, and their clients. I went into this project completely open-minded. I just wanted the truth. I know that hyperbaric as a general term and as an industry is having incredible impacts on so many different people. But I want to make sure that the information that we're sharing with one another and the information that we're using to build programs and protocols for ourselves, our loved ones, and our patients are meaningful and appropriate. And I was just hoping for this project to help add to the conversation of how do we utilize this therapy most appropriately. As far as the actual results of this project, I was incredibly surprised. In some cases, it was exactly what I thought. Higher pressure had a higher magnitude of effect. Lower pressure had a lower magnitude of effect. But there was also something that I didn't expect to find. 
especially inside the cytokine data and the epigenetic data, there were entire groups of markers inside this data set that showed higher pressure hyperbaric had an effect that lower pressure just didn't have. And there were also entire groups of markers that showed lower pressure had a certain effect that higher pressure just did not have. In other words, there are some areas of overlap that different pressures are having different magnitudes of effect, but ultimately very similar in their pattern. Yet lower pressure is doing something to us that higher pressure is not and cannot. And higher pressure is having an effect on us that lower pressure is not and cannot. And those are some of the details that I think we need to bring to the surface, do a lot more research on to understand. But this is the beginning of a new understanding of how to utilize hyperbaric most safely and most effectively, depending on what the goals of the outcomes that we're trying to have. So just as far as global results, again, I'm going to go into each of these categories in more detail in future videos. But globally, cytokines, what was the effect? The effect was mild pressure hyperbarics and high pressure hyperbarics both reduced cytokines. There was a very statistical significant decrease in the overall inflammatory response of both groups. There were 21 cytokines that were statistically significantly reduced in the mild group and 20 that were statistically significantly reduced in the high pressure group. Some of them were overlapped. There were about eight or nine cytokines that lower pressure and high pressure had in common and higher pressure had a higher degree of effect. But as I said earlier, there were a handful of cytokines that lower pressure statistically significantly reduced that while higher pressure did move the needle, it wasn't statistically significant. There were also a handful of cytokines that higher pressure reduced statistically significant, that lower pressure also reduced, but not enough. And so this is one area where I think a lot more research is necessary to really understand what testing can we or should we be doing on people so that we could start to understand which cytokine markers, if we're dealing with inflammation, which cytokine markers should we be assessing so that we understand what is the right protocol for this person based on the issues that we're finding? We'll get right back to that video, but real quick, if you're a practitioner or you're looking to get into hyperbarics and you're wanting to learn more and making sure that you're offering this therapy as effectively and as safely as possible, I want you to know that we offer a series of courses, some of which are online and some of which are in person. At thehbotcourse.com, we'll include a link below. We have several courses available from training and certification in hyperbaric medicine, safety director, as well as a few different business implementation options to get the business up and running. So if you think that training and education would be helpful for you, take a look at thehbotcourse.com. Again, the link will be in the description below. Now back to our video. In the cognitive assessment side, we saw trending improvements in motor skills, in spatial orientation, in working memory, and overall cognitive performance. While these were all trending in the right direction, a lot of these tests were not statistically significant. And I think the reason is the test we were using was not that sensitive for healthy individuals. That being said, memory was by far the most statistically significant effect of all the cognitive measurements that we took. And that was true in both of the mild and in the high pressure group. The computerized assessment that we used is really geared more towards early to mid-stage degenerative disease, where you would pick up cognitive dysfunction much more readily. And then on the epigenetic front, both mild and high pressure had enormous effects in the methylation patterns and in overall cellular aging. At the end of the research, both groups had a reduction in the overall biological age. The high pressure group did end slightly more biologically younger than the mild pressure group, but both groups did have significant effect on biological age. Both groups also had very significant findings in the rest of the methylation panel. But again, this is an interesting place that was very different. When it came to differentially methylated loci, which is basically locations inside the epigenome that are either increasing or decreasing methylation, the epigenomes responsible for which genes are we expressing and which genes are we suppressing. As certain areas are hypermethylated or methylation goes up, gene expression goes down. In areas that had hypomethylation, reduced methylation, that gene expression goes up. In the high pressure group, we had 134 different methylated loci. In the low pressure group, we had 27 differentially methylated loci. And there was zero overlap between the two. In other words, lower pressure had a very specific effect on the epigenome that was vastly different than the effect that high pressure had on the epigenome. Different locations were affected, meaning low pressure was doing something to the epigenome that high pressure was not, 
and high pressure was doing something to the epigenome that low pressure was not. Of all the DMLs, the differentially methylated loci, most of them, the overwhelming majority of them were hypermethylated. In other words, most of them seem to be shutting genes off versus turning genes back on. Most of our epigenome is in charge of suppressing information that is not supposed to be expressed inside of a cell. In fact, one of the leading theories on aging is that we lose that genetic suppression as we age, allowing cells to behave in ways that they're not designed based on their cell type. So increasing methylation and increasing the amount of genetic suppression inside of a cell is associated with improved longevity inside that cell. And that's the overwhelming finding that we had. Inside the video we do on epigenetics and my research, I'll go into more detail which of those locations were affected and ultimately what did that mean. So again, we're gonna go into more detail in the next few videos, but just to summarize, both groups reduced inflammation, both groups improved cognition, and both groups shifted the epigenome in very unique and specific ways. The other thing interesting to note was I purposefully picked three days a week for this research because so much of the research out there is based on five days a week. And if you practice hyperbaric in any way, you know that committing to a five day a week process is difficult and very time consuming. And I just wanted to also add into my questioning, could we get statistically significant responses at a lower than five times a week frequency? So again, we started to see some really amazing changes at three times a week. Keeping in mind, we did do four air breaks during that treatment time. One more thing to note is that between the baseline and the first five weeks of treatment, there were very little changes that were noted. It wasn't really until after the second round of treatment, after the second five weeks of three times a week, so a total of 50 hours of treatment, did we really start to measure massive changes inside a lot of the markers that we were looking at. That doesn't mean we wouldn't have seen changes at 25, even if we stopped and just waited a little longer to measure, but it does confirm what we already know. There's a delay between the time you start hyperbaric and the time that you could really measure meaningful changes on a lot of these different markers. So that's all we have for this video. The next few videos are gonna talk about the research in even more detail, but as always, I really appreciate your time and attention. I look forward to sharing the rest of this because I know so many of you have been waiting for this information for so long. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're not familiar with the research design challenges in hyperbaric medicine, specifically with the sham, I really want you to take a look at that video because understanding this as a big picture is gonna help you evaluate other research as you're trying to learn more about hyperbaric medicine. So if you missed that video, click on this one over here and watch that video before you watch the rest of this sequence. See you next time.